Hello, and welcome back to Business Law Online. Uh, this week we're going to be covering uh, criminal law and uh, uh, just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, I reserve, first, I reserve my right to post a second video if need be. Uh, I like to keep the videos around 50 minutes and certainly not longer than an hour. I know it's a lot of information to digest and take notes on and the like. So um, uh, I just want to put that out there. Uh, two, I will be posting our first homework assignment. Uh, it should be in the assignment board on Blackboard. It'll be an article and I want you to summarize that article. Um, uh, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. And that will be in, in addition to our normal regular discussion board question. All right, well, <coughs> let's start with the basic. What is a crime? Well, a crime is a value judgment. It's a law that represents a value judgment by society, moral judgment, that certain behaviors are so abhorrent, certain behaviors are so evil, that anyone who engages in them ought to be branded a criminal and punished as such. And what does that punishment usually entail? Some form of incarceration. It could be a jail. That's usually where people commit misdemeanors or lesser crimes are sent. It could be a prison. That's usually where people um, um, uh, who commit felonies or more serious crimes are sent. It could be parole. After you're released from jail or prison, you continue to have to see a parole officer. It could be probation. That's That would be in lieu of jail. Um, uh, but still, you have to show up um, uh, uh, and, and see your probation officer um, until they sign off. So it's some sort of loss of liberty, usually some form of incarceration. And why is it that we incarcerate people? Well, number one, uh, if they're in prison, they can't commit any crimes against society. Now, they can certainly still commit crimes against other prisoners and prison guards, etc. cetera. Uh, but at least as far as society is concerned, they can no longer commit any crimes against society. Uh, two, we imprison them because we hope, we hope, we hope it will reform them or rehabilitate them. Uh, that may or may not be the case. Lots of studies uh, in all different directions. Uh, three, we're hoping to deter others from engaging in the same sorts of behavior. Uh, you know, if you engage in this behavior, you're going to end up in jail, you're going to end up in prison, just like the defendant did here. Uh, and finally, four, and this is pretty important, uh, we incarcerate people because we want we want the victims to feel as if justice has been served. Uh, the victims, of course, are nothing more than witnesses, but uh, we don't want a society filled with vigilantes, self-serving justice. We, we want uh, the victim to feel as if the punishment did fit the crime, so to speak, so uh, to prevent the personal retribution by the victim. All right, just a few uh, uh, definitions. Or, or, or the state is the one that prosecutes the defendant. It's the state that has the right to prosecute the defendant, not the victim. And the state is represented by the prosecutor. So just, just keep that in mind. All right. I want to talk about the classifications of crimes. And there are three, but the third really isn't a class of crimes at all. Uh, but we'll get to that last. Um, the first are felonies. Felonies are the most serious crimes. And actually, I posted a video um, on, on the Blackboard uh, uh, involving a, a scene from Legally Blonde in which um, uh, Elle Wood, uh, the Reese Witherspoon character, is, is in class and they're discussing felonies versus misdemeanors. And uh, uh, as funny as the movie was, uh, the definition of felonies and misdemeanors uh, was right on target. So take a look at it. Uh, there's no assignment due to it, but uh, you know, take a look and if you want to post a comment, post a comment. That's fine. All right. Felonies, most serious crime. <coughs> They're often referred to as malum, M-A-L-U-M, in se, S-E. Uh, now, felonies are punished by more than a year in prison, up to death, plus a fine. So pretty serious crimes. Uh, and they are Crimes that are inherently evil, inherently wrong, things like murder, uh, rape, uh, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, arson, embezzlement, bribery, drugs in certain amounts. Um, felonies are also defined by a very high level of planning. That's very important. 
very important concept in criminal law. We're not punishing the act as much as the mental state. How much planning was involved in this act? The more planning, the more serious. In the felonies, there was a lot of planning. Uh, felonies are oftentimes referred to as specific intent crimes, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about elements of a crime. But for right now, all you need to know is that felonies involve a lot of planning and a lot of forethought. Misdemeanors. They're the second category of crimes, and they're lesser crimes. doesn't mean they're necessarily less serious in terms of the results, but they're lesser crimes uh, because of the mental state. Um, uh, now, misdemeanors are often referred to as malum, M-A-L-U-M, prohibita, um, and they include crimes of a lesser mental state. In other words, not a lot of planning. You know, things that are really, uh, uh, most people would just describe them as accidents, um, but that could have been avoided with a little bit of, just a little bit of care. So, uh, misdemeanors. Uh, they include things um, uh, like less serious crimes to persons, uh, like ordinary assault, criminal mischief, uh, lesser crimes against property, uh, things like graffiti, uh, petty theft, prostitution, public intoxication. Uh, uh, I think I mentioned criminal trespass as well. Now, misdemeanors also include regulatory offenses. Uh, things like, example of that would be driving without a license, right? Now, <coughs> uh, misdemeanors are different from felonies in terms of punishment as well. Misdemeanors are punishable up to a year in jail, plus a fine. Uh, but they are, generally speaking, lesser crimes. Uh, the third classification of crimes, uh, they're, they're called violations. Now, violations, uh, they're not crimes at all, really. Uh, they include things like traffic violations, parking tickets, parking violations, jaywalking, um, uh, talking on a cell phone while driving, texting while driving, things like that, violations. They're only punishable by a fine. All right, uh, so we have three, class, three classes of crimes. You have felonies, the most serious, misdemeanors, lesser crimes, and violations, which aren't even crimes at all. Believe me, if they were, uh, I would be in a lot of trouble. I got lots of violations um, between parking tickets and traffic infractions and the like. So, um, uh, and, but I can honestly say I'm not a criminal. Never been a judge or criminal. All right. Now, what makes a crime a crime? There are two elements to every crime. First, you have to have a criminal act known as the actus reus, R-E-U-S. Now, the actus reus is very important. It's got to be a criminal act. You can fantasize about committing a crime all you want. That's not a crime. It's only when you take steps towards accomplishing that crime do you get into trouble. Uh, the actus reus, it's got to be volitional. It's got to be voluntary. Very important concept there. Um, so, for instance, someone who suffers from epileptic seizures. Now, epileptic seizures... Um, you know, they come and go at odd times. But suppose someone had an epileptic seizure, and during the course of that seizure, they injured somebody. Would, would they be guilty of some form of assault or worse? No, no, because it wasn't a volitional act. It wasn't a voluntary act. Uh, so the criminal act, very important. Now, the criminal act is usually also a positive act, meaning the defendant did something. I'm not saying it's a good thing, I'm saying, though, they did something. You know, they, they punched the victim. They stole from the victim. Uh, something like that. They, 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 there, was an, there was an overt act. Uh, but the criminal act sometimes can constitute um, an omission, failing to do something. Perhaps the most common form of criminal, uh, of criminal activity uh, where omission is involved, an omission is involved would be failing to pay your taxes. Uh, when you fail to pay your taxes, you haven't done anything. You haven't. That's the problem. You haven't done anything that you were supposed to. You omitted to do something. So, uh, but that's really more the, the exception rather, rather than the rule. For the most part, uh, the criminal act, the actus reus, must be a positive act, an overt act. 
Uh, now, the second element of every crime uh, is criminal intent, also known as mens, M-E-N-S, rea, R-E-A, mens rea. That refers to the guilty state of mind. What was the defendant's state of mind? And this is a critical, critical element of any crime. I mean, to, to make it uh, um, topical, I mean, that was really the issue in the Trayvon Martin case. What was George Zimmerman's mens rea at the time the act happened? That was, that was the issue. Now, um, criminal intent, um, uh, mens rea, there are two basic types. First is specific intent. And these are usually associated, as I mentioned before, with felonies. And words that describe specific intent would be purpose or purposefully, intentional or intentionally, uh, with knowledge, uh, um, or, or, or voluntary. Uh, when one's conscious objection is the commission of the act itself, a person who acts and intends the result they intend the result when they consciously desire the result, whatever the likelihood is, and they know that the result is practically certain. As long as those two elements are there in some form or another, they have specific intent. They consciously desire the result, and they know that is practically certain to follow based on their actions. Uh, very important. That's the criminal act. I'm sorry, the criminal intent. Now, the other form of criminal intent is referred to as general intent. So we have specific intent, and then we have general intent. Now, general intent, there are two categories. You have criminal negligence and criminal recklessness or recklessness. Now, they're different. They sound the same, but they really are different. Let's start with recklessness first. Recklessness is also known as wanton, W A N. T O N conduct. And that's where the criminal defendant perceives but consciously disregards an unjustifiable risk. Uh, and his conduct is in gross deviation, not ordinary deviation, it's in gross deviation from the behavior of a reasonable person in that same circumstance. So they know the danger is there, but they don't care, they act anyway. Now, criminal negligence is a little bit different. With criminal negligence, the criminal defendant fails to perceive the unjustifiable risk to begin with. So which one do you think is more serious? If you were charged with a criminal negligence crime or a recklessness crime? Well, I mean, they're both pretty serious regardless. But which one, is, which one sounds more, well, intentional? Recklessness. Because with recklessness, you actually knew of the risk. But you don't care. You just did the action anyway. What's the difference between the two? Well, uh, the more facts, the more likely. So, uh, you know, if someone were injured in a car accident, uh, ordinarily that's not a crime. But uh, what if they were speeding? What if their headlights didn't work? What if their horn didn't work? Uh, what if it was raining? What if their tires were bold? The more facts, the more dangerous facts you can add up, the more likely it is that the uh, defendant's actions were reckless rather than just plain old negligent. So uh, that, that's kind of the dividing line there. Now, as an outlier, an important outlier, I want to talk about strict liability crimes for a couple of minutes. Now, I just finished saying that every crime requires a criminal act, also known as an actus reus, and criminal intent, also known as mens rea. Well, there are some crimes that do not require a mens rea. In other words, you, your thoughts can be completely innocent, but just by virtue of the fact that you engaged in the acts, you are liable, or you can be liable. Um, those are referred to as strict liability crimes. All you need is just the act. You don't need the mens rea. Now, most of the time, they're regulatory in nature. Uh, companies oftentimes get cited by the EPA and other um, uh, environmental agencies for dumping or discharging pollutants into the atmosphere. They may never have known it was a pollutant, 
or a toxin of some kind. They may have believed that, hey, you know, this is no big deal. You know, this, is, this isn't harmful. It's still a crime. They discharged a the pollutant. The act is all you need. The other strict liability crime that oftentimes makes headlines and even made for TV movies, statutory rape. Now, statutory rape is sexual relations with someone under the age of majority. In other words, a minor. Now, <coughs> it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference at all what you reasonably believed the victim's age to be. You could have said, you know, I met him, I met him at a bar. Uh, they were ordering drinks. They were smoking. They were basically acting like an adult, and they looked like an adult. And probably by all reasonable standards, most people will conclude they were were an adult. No, that's not a defense. That's not a defense. Now, some states have started to change that a little bit. Uh, but most states still have that strict liability crime uh, uh, definition for statutory rape. That as long as you engage in the conduct with someone who's a minor, you're guilty. It doesn't make a difference what age you thought they actually were. All right. Um, I'm going to go over some specific crimes now, and uh, uh, this is important. I want to first talk about uh, crimes against uh, property, against individuals, uh, and maybe even uh, businesses. Simple crimes. Now, the, the base crime, the basic crime, the touchstone crime, if you will, the first one is larceny. Now, larceny is the broadest crime of them all. It's the wrongful and fraudulent taking of personal property. That's it. The wrongful and fraudulent taking of personal property. <coughs> now, that taking, it's got to be an actual taking, or it could be a constructive taking. In other words, an actual taking would be like, for instance, a pickpocket. They reach into your pocket, they grab your wallet or your purse, and they take it, and that's it. A constructive taking would be like, for instance, being in possession of documents that give you the right to possess the property. So um, that would be constructive taking. You don't actually have it, but you have documents that give you the right to it. Okay? Um, at some point, the larceny, at some point the property does, though, have to be kind of taken away uh, from the place it occupies. Okay. Um, and of course, it is a specific intent crime. There's always a high degree of planning in this crime. So larceny, important building block crime, because the next crime I'm going to talk about is larceny plus violence. Robbery. Robbery. Now, robbery is the taking of personal property from another by the use of force, or the threat of immediate force. So, for instance, someone pointing a gun at you and saying, give me your pocketbook, give me your wallet. You know what's going to happen or if you don't do it, right? It's the threat of immediate force. So you have the taking of personal property, the wrongful taking of personal property, sounds a lot like larceny, but add force to it, and it's robbery. Now, what about pickpocket? What about pickpocket? Now, pickpocket, their MO, their MO separanda, is to go undetected. They don't want to be detected. Uh, they don't want you to realize you're missing your wallet or your purse or your pocketbook or your, your cell phone or your Kindle or whatever until you get home and look for those items. And then you say, I've been pickpocketed. Well, is that robbery? No, it's not robbery because a pickpocket doesn't use force. What if, however, you're on the subway and you feel somebody reaching into your back pocket or your pocketbook or into your jacket or something and you realize that you are being pickpocketed. You turn, you confront the individual, maybe you grab their arm. Right? That individual then takes a swipe at you, hitting you or missing you, causing you to fall, whatever. Have they now committed robbery? They're using force to effectuate their escape. In New York, yes, that's robbery. When you use force to effectuate your escape, 
As a pickpocket, you've taken the next step up from just larceny up to robbery. That's a violent crime. It's a violent crime. Now, the next crime is a combination of criminal trespass plus larceny, and that's referred to as burglary. Now, burglary, back in the old days, the common law days, was referred to as breaking and entering. And for those of you who are fans of law and order, right, the detectives on that show still use the term breaking and entering. Why? Because in the common law, there had to be a forceful entry. The criminal defendant had to break a window. They had to pick a lock. They had to kick a door in. They had to do something to get a, a breaking, a forceful entry into the premises. Um, second, they had to go into the premises. Now, the common law actually even had additional requirements. Not only had there to be a forceful entry uh, in criminal trespass, but it had to happen at night. And, and burglary only occurred at residential premises. It never occurred um, um, uh, in businesses. Uh, why? Why these additional requirements? It had to be a breaking of something, a forceful entry, uh, uh, an illegal entry. It had to happen at night. It had to happen at residential premises. Why all these additional criteria? Well, probably because uh, um, it really wasn't that long ago that the punishment for any felony of which burglary was, was death. The death penalty, capital punishment. If you were charged and convicted of a, of a felony, uh, you were going to get the death sentence. That was it. So maybe it was kind of the law's way of saying, you know, that's a pretty extreme punishment. So before we're going to do it, you know, we got to make sure that you satisfy all these additional criteria. Maybe. Uh, maybe also, too, there was a sense that uh, burglary is a special crime. You know, it, it, uh, that people should feel as if their home is their castle, especially at night. They, they should feel secure in sleeping, that they're not going to be violated in any way. Maybe that was also part of it. But burglary. Uh, burglary uh, is, is, in the broadest sense, the unauthorized uh, entering or remaining in any building, any time of night, with the intent to commit a felony. So, uh, you know, if you go someplace you're not supposed to, that's criminal trespass. Now, what about remaining? Right? Remaining someplace without authority. Well, that would be like, for instance, you go to a mall, and uh, uh, five minutes before closing time, you duck into a broom closet or a stairwell or something like that, and you hide out. Why? Because you want to wait till the mall clears and then rob it. Right. So, uh, uh, burglary, a uh, very important crime. Um, it's unauthorized entering or remaining in the building, um, and you have to have an intent to commit a crime. So it's really two crimes. You have criminal trespass, unauthorized entry, and intent to commit a larceny. So it's criminal trespass plus larceny. That equals <coughs> burglary. Um, another crime that's really important and it's actually part of your project, your homework assignment, is extortion. Now extortion, um, that's the taking of personal property uh, from someone uh, with their consent, but the consent is induced uh, by the wrongful use uh, of, or threatened use of, of force, violence, or fear. And it's gotta be a future threat. Not an immediate threat. If it's an immediate threat, it's robbery. Extortion is a future threat. And that's really what happened. When you read the article that, that I'm going to post, uh, keep that definition in mind. So extortion. Uh, it could also be um, uh, taking, inducing someone's consent by uh, threatening to reveal an embarrassing secret. Although, you know, I, I wonder what, by today's standards, what would be embarrassing, um, you know. Um, but, but in any event... Uh, extortion. That's when you obtain somebody's property with their consent, but the consent is induced um, uh, by the use of or, or, or the threatened use of, of future force, uh, violence or fear of some kind. All right. Um, another important crime, uh, receiving stolen property. That's a big issue in retail. 
really the, 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 the number one place where merchandise, stolen merchandise is fenced is eBay. It's a huge issue for retailers, costing billions of dollars uh, every year, receiving stolen property. So if you buy something that's stolen, well, you may have committed a crime. Now, it is a specific intent crime, and that's when someone knowingly receives stolen property and intends to deprive the rightful owner. So, so how is it that retailers combat uh, uh, well, shoplifting and, and ultimately receiving stolen property? Well, oh, by the way, shoplifting, that would be larceny. That would be a form of larceny. There's no force involved. There's no uh, uh, breaking and entering. Uh, there's no entry onto the premises. So that would be a type of larceny. So how do retailers combat shoplifting and receiving stolen property? Their investigators are on eBay. And every store has a unique SKU. And they can tell just by the SKU that goods, that those goods were stolen or not. So uh, as a matter of fact, a big uh, selling point on eBay is what? In original packaging. So uh, that, that's kind of a um, code word in a lot of ways for stolen. Uh, so they go on eBay and they try to build a case that way. All right. Uh, another important crime against uh, businesses or individuals, persons, arson. Arson. Now, arson <coughs> is the willful burning of a dwelling or a person. Uh, you have to have specific intent or at least criminal recklessness. Recklessness. You can't have criminal negligence. That's a different type of crime. Okay. But arson, you have to have specific intent and um, um, or, or recklessness. Now, uh, arson is often committed, uh, for instance, by failing businesses who say want to burn their warehouse down so they can do what? They can collect insurance proceeds. Um, well, what if um, you want to commit arson? You decide that the business isn't going well. You want to burn the warehouse down to the ground um, uh, and you start a fire and lots of there's lots of smoke but no part of the building burned is that still arson it's just all smoke damage well in New York no in New York arson requires that something burns if it doesn't burn it's not arson it's a different crime attempted arson attempted arson um, so those, those are some crimes against uh, 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 people and businesses that I want you to know. All right, uh, I want to go over a couple of white collar crimes. Uh, the first of which is forgery. Now this occurs when a written document is fraudulently made or, or altered um, in some way and that change affects the liability of another person. So, for instance, suppose your grandmother sends you a check for ten dollars for your birthday. That's very sweet of her, very kind of her. Uh, but you know, grandma's a little older, and she thinks that ten dollars is really a lot of money. But you know, she could probably afford more. So you decide, well, you know, I could change the ten to a one on the check and add a hundred. No problem. In addition, she left a lot of space. One zero dash zero zero. So it's a lot of space. I could probably put another zero in there. So you turn a $10 check into a $100 check. That's forgery. That is forgery. Uh, a funny example of forgery uh, of, of when a document is created um, uh, and it alters or changes the liability of another person is in the movie uh, Chuck and Larry, uh, starring Kevin James and Adam Sandler. They both play, uh, if, if you haven't seen it before, they both play New York City firefighters. And uh, you know, to make a long story short, the Kevin James character uh, is going to lose a lot of important benefits if he can't prove he's married. So um, he convinces Adam Sandler to basically act as his partner. And they go down to Borough Hall in Brooklyn, uh, right by the courthouse, and they fill out basically a, a partnership certificate. And they say what? That they are in fact partners or married. I forget the term. Um, they create a document that was false. That's also another form of forgery. Uh, what about this scenario? Uh, a husband comes home and leaves his paycheck 
on the kitchen table. Wife picks up the paycheck, signs his name, and deposits it into a joint account. Uh, is that considered forgery? Are you intending uh, 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 to deprive? Is the wife intending to deprive the husband of his money? Well, no. She deposited in one kind of account, a joint account. So the money, the husband has access to the money. Now, it'd be different if she uh, uh, deposited it into her own account. Then it's different. Uh, but by virtue of the fact that she deposited it into a joint account, uh, there's no intent. Uh, there's no intent whatsoever um, uh, um, to defraud uh, uh, the husband of his money. All right, another important white collar crime that you should be aware of is embezzlement. Now, the key to embezzlement is the fraudulent taking of of someone's property by a person who was in a position of trust, by a person who was trusted with the property. So who does that all usually include? Who usually commits embezzlement? Uh, accountants, they commit embezzlement. Um, uh, officers and directors of a corporation, um, they commit embezzlement. Attorneys, if they have their client's money in their escrow account, uh, they've committed embezzlement. The key is you have to have been entrusted with the property. That's embezzlement. Uh, it could also be some kind of trustee. Uh, so anyone, anyone with a right to the checkbook, basically, can be charged with embezzlement if they take uh, um, uh, the money that's been entrusted to them or the property. Um, a good example, a good real-life example, I'm sure everyone knows the singer Billy Joel. Uh, well, his his uh, uh, brother-in-law, his ex-brother-in-law, was his business manager. And uh, basically, he stole every penny that Billy Joel had, uh, to the point at which I think Billy Joel actually declared bankruptcy. Now, he subsequently went on tour and made money back. Uh, but still, uh, his brother-in-law committed embezzlement. Uh, the third type of white-collar crime I want to uh, uh, discuss is bribery. Now, bribery is interesting. Bribery requires two people. You have the offerer, the briber, the one who makes the bribe offer, and you have the offeree, the bribee, the one who either accepts the bribe or uh, uh, or not. So you have two types of, uh, of individuals in this crime. Now, bribery is often referred to as a payoff or a kickback. Um, you have to have specific intent. You can't do it negligently or even recklessly. Um, now, what about the briber, the offerer, the one who is making the bribe or asking, uh, soliciting the bribe uh, to the offeree? Uh, when did they actually commit the bribe? Is it when they make the offer or after it's been accepted by the offeree? Well, it's when they made the offer. The moment they made the offer, the offerer, the briber, uh, they commit the crime of bribery. Now, what about the offeree, the bribee, the one who the bribe was made to um, uh, or asked for? Um, they only commit the crime of bribery if they accept the bribe. That's it. Uh, um, that's an interesting crime, though. It requires two people. You know, you just can't have one person uh, uh, charged with bribery. You gotta have two. You gotta have two people. All right. Uh, what's another crime that requires two people? Rico. Rico is a good one. Rico is one of my favorite crimes. Uh, Rico stands for the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. Now, the act was actually named after a character played by Edward G. Robinson in the 1930s film. Um, Little Caesar. Um, the film Little Caesar. <laughs> my phone. The film Little Caesar was about uh, uh, basically a, a mob family, and the head of the family, his name was Rico. <clears throat> so when Congress passed this law in the seventies, they decided to name it after that character, Rico. Now, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act requires the following at the minimum. You have to have two or more people acting as a criminal enterprise, and they had to have carried out two or more crimes 
in the furtherance of that enterprise. So that's RICO. Um, the point of RICO was not to go after individuals, it was to go after the entire criminal structure. It's, it's, it's an effective statute, and they've gone after a lot of different uh, organizations with it. Um, now, what if you know, you're engaged in a criminal enterprise and you're making all kinds of money? What about that money? Is it legal? Is it, is it a crime to keep that money? You know, you commit the crime, now you have the proceeds from the crime. Is being in possession of those proceeds, is that enough uh, to, com to be considered a crime? Well, it is. It is. And if you try to hide that money, it can become problematic. That's referred to as money laundering. And there's the Money Laundering Control Act. Now, the crime of money laundering was meant to go after the proceeds of the crime. And there are two elements that must be proved. One, the defendant knowingly engaged in a financial transaction worth more than $10,000. And two, the defendant knowingly engaged in a fin financial transaction and they knew that the proceeds came from some kind of illegal activity. So some of you might be thinking, well, you know, instead of engaging in a fin financial transaction of $10,000 or more, um, uh, maybe I'll avoid money laundering. I'll, I'll only deposit, say, $5,000 or less. You know, well, you still committed the crime of money laundering, but in addition, you commit the crime of financial structuring. And that's when you structure your financial transactions to avoid money laundering. So, again, it's two things. Defendant knowingly engaged in a financial transaction worth more than $10,000. That's usually a deposit in the bank. And two, they knew that the proceeds came from an illegal activity. Money laundering, very important crime uh, and an effective tool as well. Uh, there's the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And basically it made it illegal, a felony, for U.S. companies, officers, directors, agents, or employees, or any third party acting on their behalf to bribe a foreign government official. Now, uh, I'm going to editorialize a little bit. Um, suppose you do bribe uh, someone in um, Turkey, right? the country of Turkey, you bribe a government official in Turkey. Well, Turkey has laws. They have their own laws. Uh, the act, the act occur in the United States? Uh, no, it didn't occur in the United States. It occurred in Turkey. So, uh, in a sense, the U.S. is extending its criminal jurisdiction over its borders. Uh, but in any event, uh, there are two defenses um, uh, to uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. One, the payment was legal under the laws of the host country. And two, it's a bona fide business expense. In other words, hey, you know, uh, I'd rather do business with uh, this government official face to face. And that requires that I fly this government official off to a nice location, put them up in a nice hotel and pay for nice dinners for them where we, where we will discuss business. That's how business is done. Uh, but anyway, those are the two defenses to it. All right, another crime uh, that's important for you to know uh, is the Information Infrastructure Protection Act. And what this does, it protects any computer that's connected to the internet, whether or not they have uh, uh, antivirus or firewall software or whatever the case may be. It basically criminalizes computer hacking. Uh, there's also the Identity Theft and Assumption Deterrence Act, very important. Uh, that criminalizes, basically it turns into a felony, uh, uh, identity theft. So uh, those two acts together, uh, the tools are there for, for computer crimes, absolutely, which are only going to grow in the future. All right, now, <clears throat> what about corporations? <coughs> In this post Enron world, corporations are considered persons under the 14th Amendment. They have certain rights, just like any individual. But is a corporation flesh and blood? No. Corporation is what? Paper. When we cover corporations, we're going to find out that corporations are nothing more then their articles of incorporation and their bylaws. They're just paper, or maybe not even paper anymore, just electronic uh, uh, files. 
uh, how can they be considered persons? Well, they are. The Supreme Court has ruled on it. They are considered persons. Uh, but uh, what about corporate criminal liability? Is it possible to charge a corporation with a crime? Well, under the common law, you could not. You could not charge corporations with a crime. When I mean common law, I mean more than 100 years ago. Why? Because the courts realized uh, corporations, uh, they don't have a conscience. They don't have a soul. They don't have flesh and blood. Um, uh, they don't act. You know, the people who run them act. They're the ones who act. Now, they could still be, those people can still be charged with individual crimes. Uh, but as far as the corporation was concerned, can't, can't charge it with a crime. Now, that has changed. Uh, by statute, corporations can now be charged with a crime. Um, but how do you punish a corporation? You can't incarcerate it. You can't put it in jail. You can't put it on probation. Uh, basically, just fining it. That's it. Leveling, leveling big fines. That's it. That's all you can do. Uh, but nonetheless, corporations can now be found liable. All right. Uh, now, what about some... Uh, 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 constitutional safeguards. Actually, the Constitution has a lot to say about corporate, or a lot to say about criminal liability. I'll start first with the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the Fourth Amendment protects persons and corporations from unreasonable searches and seizures by government agents. This has been interpreted to mean that before a government agent can search your person or your property, they have to obtain a warrant from a judge based on probable cause, meaning it's more likely than not a crime was committed. Now, uh, uh, warrants are usually written uh, 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 pretty narrowly in terms of, of place and scope, um, uh, but that's the Fourth Amendment. It requires law enforcement to get a warrant. Now, there are exceptions to that. And I'll just discuss some of them uh, uh, briefly. Uh, warrantless searches have been permitted, permitted when uh, the arresting officer basically witnessed the crime and made the arrest, right? Uh, you're arresting someone, you can search their person in the, in the immediate surrounding area. Uh, two, where the evidence is in, quote, plain view, uh, the most common example of that would be um, uh, you know, you're pulled over for some kind of traffic infraction, maybe a busted taillight or failure to signal or something like that. Uh, or speeding, and uh, on the front seat of your car, you have some kind of contraband in plain view. Law enforcement does not need to get a, a warrant in that situation. Um, there's a, a likelihood that the evidence will be destroyed. Uh, you know, perhaps in hot pursuit of, say, uh, someone you believe that they're going to flush the evidence down the toilet or something like that. Uh, then that could also be an exception to a warrantless search. Uh, or an exception for a warrantless search. Uh, and finally, if someone's life is in danger, uh, referred to as exigent circumstances. If someone's life is in danger, then law enforcement is not required to get a search warrant. Uh, basically, you have to get a search warrant if you have the time. If you don't have the time, you don't, based on those four exceptions. The Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, very important. It says that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case uh, to be a witness against himself. Meaning what? If you're charged with a crime, if you're charged with a crime, you do not have to testify against yourself. Now, what about things like fingerprints and DNA samples? You know, if you give your fingerprints, are you giving evidence against yourself? Well, you are. But the Supreme Court has said, no, that's not testimony. That's not testimony. So the Fifth Amendment prohibits the state from calling the defendant as a witness in his own prosecution. Uh, but that does not extend to fingerprints or, DNA, or bodily fluid samples for DNA and the like. Um, the Fifth Amendment also includes the, the attorney-client privilege. What does that mean? That means that as your attorney, uh, you could tell me anything you need to tell me that will help in defense of a crime that you've been charged with. Charged with. You can tell me about anything that has happened. Happened. I'm stressing the past tense. Why? Because the attorney-client privilege only extends to crimes in the past, not in the future. If you, as my client, were to tell me of a crime that you intend to commit, 
the attorney-client privilege does not extend to that. I can be called to testify. Uh, the Fifth Amendment also contains uh, the uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, patient privilege, uh, the priest penitent privilege. And if you if you go to any kind of if you go to any kind of of um, uh, religious leader for religious instruction, um, that's fine. Uh, that that's considered privilege. Um, the Fifth Amendment also contains the double jeopardy clause. Uh, what that means is that the state cannot charge you twice for the same crime. There's a hitch there. The same crime, but the same act can, can constitute multiple crimes. So let me give you an example. Suppose I was charged with murder, and I was charged in state court, and I went to trial. And uh, uh, the, the jury came back and said, Professor Urtel is not guilty. Okay. Um, I walk out a free man, state court. But suppose that witness, or the, my victim, was a witness for the federal government. Suppose they were a federal witness. The murder of a federal witness is a separate crime from murder. So the moment I walk out of state court, federal law enforcement officials could be there to arrest me and charge me with a federal crime. It's a different crime. It's not the same crime. It's a different crime. It's the same facts but it's a different crime. So double jeopardy, uh, very important. Uh, the Sixth Amendment includes a right to a jury trial in criminal matters, uh, the right to confront uh, uh, and cross-examine witnesses, hostile witnesses. It guarantees the assistance of a lawyer and a right to a speedy trial. So the Sixth Amendment, very important. The Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Now, usually this is discussed in the context of capital punishment. I'm not going to talk about capital punishment. I'm going to really keep the conversation light. <coughs> I want to talk about Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Um, for those of you who might be familiar with him, um, you know who he is. For those, those of you not, he's a sheriff out in Arizona, Maricopa County. And uh, he runs basically the jails out there. And he makes his prisoners wear pink jumpsuits and wear pink underwear. Uh, is that cruel and unusual punishment? What was the point of wearing pink? The pink is to uh, really kind of emasculate them a little bit. You know, you know, you're a big tough guy committing all these crimes. Now you're going to wear pink clothing. Uh, maybe it's unusual. I don't know if it's cruel. But, but anyway, uh, cruel and unusual punishment um, is prohibited by the Eighth Amendment. Just a little food for thought. All right, I want to talk briefly about criminal procedure. I think I'm doing well here. Um, um, now, criminal procedure is in part based upon the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment and, 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 and whatnot, and the Fourth Amendment, of course. Uh, criminal procedure is not... Uh, it doesn't. Dis we're not going to discuss specific crimes. We're going to talk about how they are prosecuted. Now, what's the first step in any criminal procedure? It's the arrest. Okay. Now, the arrest has to be based on probable cause. Probable cause means uh, that it's just more likely than not a crime was committed. If law enforcement has time to get a warrant, they better do so. If, if they can say it's one of the exceptions, they better have probable cause. So the arrest. The defendant is taken into custody by the executive branch. The police are part of the executive branch. The second step, well, it depends. If the defendant was charged with a felony, then the state has to present evidence to a grand jury. And the grand jury will determine whether or not there was, in fact, probable cause. And if the grand jury determines there was probable cause, the grand jury will hand up an indictment. They'll hand up an indictment to the court. Now, the indictment is the actual charging document. They list the crimes that the defendant is liable or will be charged for. Not liable necessarily, that's a trial. They list the crimes that the defendant will be charged. <coughs> now, the grand jury has seven days to act. So for seven days, the criminal defendant is on pins and needles. 
If they don't act after seven days, the criminal defendant goes free. If the criminal defendant was arrested for a misdemeanor, there's no grand jury. There's only an information. And the information is basically, again, the charging document. It lists the criminal charges that will be brought against the defendant. Now, where, where is the indictment read? Where is the information, if the indictment in a, in, a, in a felony case, where is it read? The information in a, in a misdemeanor case, where is it read? It's read at the arraignment. That's the third step of the process. So the first step is the arrest. The second step is grand jury indictment or information. The third step is the arraignment. Now, the arraignment is the most important step in the process. That's the step where the defendant is transferred from the executive branch of government to the judicial branch of government. Now remember, we believe in the separation of, of powers, big part of our constitution. So that's a big step in the process. Now at the arraignment, the indictment is read. At the arraignment, the information is read. And the defendant enters a plea of guilty or not guilty. And bail is also set. Okay. Now after arraignment, uh, usually there's a period of plea bargaining where there'll be court conferences on the case. Now, plea bargaining kind of gets a bad deal. It, it, se it seems as if the defendant is being let off easy. Well, not necessarily. Uh, when you take a plea, uh, you're giving up your right, number one, to a jury trial. And number two, you're giving up your right to appeal. You can't appeal a plea. So you're stuck with it. You're stuck with it. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, if the case can't be pled out, uh, then the fifth step is a trial. Now, again, the defendant can only be charged, tried once per charge. Uh, but the trial, what is the threshold to convict a defendant? It's proof. Is it proof beyond all doubt? Is it proof beyond a shadow of a doubt? No. It's just uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And a reasonable doubt is a doubt that would cause you to hesitate in making the most important decision of your life. Uh, that's the, if you want to put a number on it, um, you can say 95%. Right? Just you don't have to be 100% certain, just 95% certain. That's for a trial. Now, after trial, if the defendant is found guilty, the defendant is sentenced. And um, um, uh, that's where the judge hands out the punishment. Uh, each state handles it their own way. In the District of Columbia, they handle it their own way. Uh, but in federal court, it's a little bit different. Uh, there was a perception way back when that the sentences, the punishments, varied too much from one judge to another in federal court. So in 1984, Congress passed the Federal Sentencing Guidelines, the uh, Sentencing Reform Act. And uh, what this did was it limited the number of, of, of uh, uh, factors and variables a judge can consider when rendering a sentence. The idea was that we want the sentences to be the same from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction. Um, so just uh, an important fact to know. Now, obviously, after a trial, if you're the criminal defendant and you're not happy, you can appeal. If you're the prosecution. Can you appeal? Well, generally speaking, no. No, the defendant is free. Uh, but there are exceptions to that, but you don't need to know that. All right, we covered a lot. Uh, and, um, um, you know, please take notes, continue to take notes. Uh, I will post the homework at some point, uh, in addition to the regular um, uh, uh, discussion board. All right. Very good. Thank you.